to the public session of the today's committee meeting, uh, which is taking place uh, virtually via WebEx and in person at City Hall. As this process will be new to some of us, uh, I want to remind those who are attending in person that it is important if you're not speaking to ensure that uh, the room microphone is turned off. And if you're joining WebEx application from a committee room to ensure that the audio is dis disabled uh, from your account. Uh, this ensures that uh, we avoid uh, feedback and uh, for those joining uh, through the WebEx application. Good morning. Uh, let me uh, begin uh, with an acknowledgement that the land each of us is on as we hold this uh, virtual meeting is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishwabi, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now the, the home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples, and uh, we also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. During the public session, uh, there are two presentations, uh, one regarding Human Resources Division update and one providing TCHC's 2023 Strategic Communication Plan. There is also one report providing an overview of our efforts uh, in developing strategic plan for TCHC for the 24 to 28 period. <clears throat> With the move to a hybrid meeting format, we will modify slightly the process that we have previously established for voting during the course of today's virtual meeting. Members of the committee were whether attending in person or remotely will be asked to vote by way of a show of hands. Members of the public wanting to depute uh, to an agenda item have the option to either submit a written deputation which is distributed to the committee prior to the meeting uh, or to participate in the meeting and depute to the committee via WebEx or to verbally depute to the committee in person at today's meeting. Finally, uh, the deputation summary uh, we have today, we have uh, two um, dep deputations um, for item five and seven of the, uh, of the agenda. Uh, I ask, uh, there's uh, only one person I believe here from the public. Uh, if there are uh, any uh, other, but I see none. Uh, so um, I'd like to ask the uh, directors uh, present here if there are any items other than obviously we're holding five and seven that you would like to hold. Okay. Any, any other items that... Uh, we need to hold other than item seven, which is uh, with regards to business arising from the public meeting minutes. Um, and I think the item was uh, the third uh, in that, uh, in that, in the business arising and the strategic communications plan um, uh, is a deputant with regard to that. So other than those two items, are there any other items that uh, you wish to hold? I uh, can't see, I don't think everybody online, so if uh, there's anybody there, please speak up on, on WebEx uh, committee members. But I hear, well, I don't see everybody, but I... Did Councillor Crisanti get in when he was trying to get in? Uh, I haven't seen him, uh, Paula. Uh, oh. And uh, so, uh, unfortunately... <laughs> So uh, on that note, we will hold uh, item five and seven and uh, 
and proceed. We have. Um, uh, we're, we're, did I skip? That's uh, item four. It's the next item, and uh, we're, of course, we're we will hold uh, item four. I was just once. Um, if there's any questions with regards to the minutes, Paula, if you have. Uh, a correction or expansion you want to ask, please do. Uh, can someone pull that up on the screen? So we can see it. Item on page 10. Uh, okay. I think my microphone's on now. It had to do with... Um, all the materials that we couldn't get there. So, I, the motion, I guess I'm still concerned about where anybody would see what the agendas were. Did we agree that at least the agenda items would all be posted by meeting, by year, and then if someone is interested in different things, they could be given that. So this was on ADA mean well access? It's on the fact that all the minutes were taken off the website. So there is no board or committee minutes for I forget how many years. Back to something, twenty eleven or the two thousand and four to two thousand and eleven, I think. Uh, so through the chair I uh, and I, I'll invite uh, Paula Knight, who's also in, in uh, the meeting virtually, to add to what I'm going to say if I get it wrong. Um, but my understanding is that the outcome of the consideration of this matter at committee and at the board was that the agendas and minutes for all meetings uh, between 2012, uh, January of 2012 and December of 2020 would remain on the website so that members of the public interested in understanding what transpired at those meetings would be able to access the agenda for the meeting and the minutes of the meeting and that if they wanted the um, supporting reports that informed the board or committee's consideration of those matters they could request it but the agendas and minutes for all of the meetings would remain on the website Paula is that correct Yes, through the chair, Dara, that, that is correct, um, and they will be accessible. So that's from 2012 to 2020, and then from 2020 onwards? Uh, the material remains on the website, agendas, minutes, and reports, accessible to the public. And for the period prior to January of 2012, again, all of the agendas and minutes and uh, reports supporting the matters considered in those meetings remains accessible. It's only in the period uh, between January of 2012 and December of 2020 that the supporting reports would not be accessible directly from the website. And sorry, the 2004 to 2012? Agendas, minutes, and supporting reports would be accessible through the, through the website. Well, that's going on the website. Correct. 2004 to 2012? To the extent that they exist, yes, absolutely. They're there. Right. I'm sorry, to the extent that they exist, that... Sorry. Anything that exists is there. If there was, if there wasn't, if it was a verbal report, if there was, if there was no supporting report, anything that was on the website prior to this change being made will be back on the website now that we're reverting back to the original approach. Okay, and what about from the founding of TCHC in 20, I think it was 2021? Yeah, no, yeah, 2001, not two years ago. Thank so, you, Brian. <laughs> so, so to the... Those, those few years. So to simplify, um, anything that was on the website prior to January of 2012 will be on the website now and will continue to be on the website. Minutes, reports, and agendas. Okay. So 
this is, um, forgive me, these are the minutes at this meeting, which we would approve. And did this go already to the board? Uh, yes, this was considered by the board at its last meeting. The date which was? April 24th. April 24th, uh, maybe I wasn't there. Um, was it considered that? <laughs> so at the board, I'm sorry, dear, at the board, it was reported, and it's in the minutes of the board, that all documents from its inception until 2023 board meetings, committee reports will be, uh, agendas will be on, available on the website, except for those years 2012 to 2020, and those reports will be available by asking for them. Yes, that's correct. Because, all right. Okay, thank you. Is that because as of 2012, we're, we're using new? So, so um, as of January 2012, material that was uh, posted to the website would need to be uh, posted in a manner that is AODA compliant. And uh, the, the, the degree to which the material on the website for the period from uh, January 2012 to December 2020 was ex accessed by members of the public um, was found not to be um, uh, at, to a degree that would warrant the expenditure of the cost that would need to be uh, expended in order to make all those documents compliant. And so the, the approach that's been taken for those documents and those documents only is to remove them from the website, um, but to make them available in a compliant form to any member of the public who makes a request for them. Uh, presumably if uh, processes are technology catches up with the requirements that where those things can be translated a lot easier we, we will can reflect on that at a future date and I see um, I see Ms. Knight is nodding her head so I'm going to say yes I think that was part of the, the dis <laughs> discussion because of the it's a technology issue as important as it is as a uh, a compliance issue Pardon? Oh, sorry, Marcel. I only see the top of your head gesture, <laughs> your screen. You had a question, Marcel. You may be on mute. Uh, technology, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, just two questions. When, when you say that uh, documents are going to be translated for, um, for people yeah, so it's accessible. Is it including people that have no site? I'm not sure, Paula or there. And the other, the other thing is, if someone requests a document, what's the wait time on that? Is it like a couple of days, a week, a month, two months? Uh, so through the chair, I can answer this question. So in regards to your first question, uh, Director Charlebois, the, the accessibility standards that we're applying uh, allow for screen readers to be used so that that would be available to people who have no visit, who are, who are blind. Uh, and that's part of the technology standards of the AODA, so they can use screen readers. As it relates to turnaround time, we're aiming for a five-day turnaround time should um, individuals request um, documents that aren't available in accessible format to be made accessible. Any further questions, Marcel? No. Any other questions? Then I ask for a motion to uh, accept the minutes as uh, circulated. Thanks, Debbie. Seconded by Uba. All those in favor? Motions carried. Thank you. Um, uh, the next item is item five, business arising. Uh, we do have a deputant uh, 
Catherine Wilkinson, who wants to speak with regards to action item three. Is there any board member who wants to speak to any other item uh, in, in the uh, business arising uh, item? No? So then uh, at this point, uh, I see Catherine there. So uh, uh, d if we can, do we have to do anything or just invite uh, uh, Catherine to speak to uh, uh, her item? Uh, do we? So, um, Ms. Wilkinson, uh, if you if you can hear us and uh, if you want to continue with your deputation, you can you can begin at any time. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I couldn't let you have a meeting without me, Brian. I know. I know you'd miss me. <laughs> okay, so on item five, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, on item five, uh, on the agenda. This report is listed as a briefing note, Republic Action Item 3. I don't know why there's feedback, but there is. Um, there, it does not indicate a subject of the briefing note. So in terms of searching online to look at a report, there's no name on the agenda. So in the future, if only agendas are posted, that's not very helpful. Uh, but I also wanted to indicate that I think we need to come to a better understanding of what constitutes a briefing note. Typically, it's a short one to three page concise document uh, that informs a decision maker about an issue. Uh, this particular briefing note is only, you know, it's six pages, but there's two attached supporting presentations attached to that, making it now 45 pages. And the two additional supporting documents are also not listed on the agenda. So no one knows they exist from looking at an agenda. So when considering inclusion and removing barriers to access, we need to ensure transparency by itemizing all reports being presented on the agenda. The diversity survey um, that's presented highlights areas where we are doing well and identifies areas for improvement. So a couple of notes. 22% uh, of employees experience a disability with a mental health and chronic illness as the most common. Working at TCHC actually can be stressful, particularly you know for the frontline staff. And it's really important to identify what workplace triggers there are and implement strategies to help staff respond to stress and to have those coping mechanisms in place. And Toronto Housing can be really proud of the work they have done to ensure the physical work environment is accessible to tenants and to staff with disabilities. According to the survey results, only 2% of employees experience a physical disability. So what I wanted to highlight was perhaps when reviewing recruitment practices you may wish to consider if there are real or perceived barriers that are preventing people with disabilities from applying and develop a strategy to recruit candidates with disabilities. In the heat maps in the presentation, it would be really helpful if there was a legend on each page so that recipients can readily interpret the data that they're looking at. And one thing that stood out in the presentation under trends and analysis, as the length of service increases, the sense of belonging decreases. Now, this is disheartening, uh, but perhaps not surprising given the frequent restructuring at Toronto Housing over the years. Employees have to adjust and comply with constant changes, often making them more like a survivor than feeling like part of a team. You know, staff want to be considered uh, and, uh, and consulted on organizational changes, particularly as it impacts their day-to-day -day work. Implementing or revising corporate policies or practices that impact staff in their day-to-day -day work should automatically include employees who actually perform that work in addition to other levels of staff as appropriate. Including staff in the decision-making that impacts their day-to-day -day work it improves their sense of value 
uh, and they're being able to offer up their experience as an employee and ultimately improves their performance and their perception of Toronto Housing as an employer. The Human Resources Department continues to evolve and has adapted well to their changing role in the workplace, expanding services to be more inclusive, being able to identify and action areas for improvement. This continued work will pay dividends for Toronto Housing employees and tenants in the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Uh, are there any questions of the deputy? Um, I don't know whether Barbara, you, oh, Debbie, did you have a? No, I don't have, thank you for your deputation, Catherine. I don't have any questions. Uh, just my own, I felt the information is great. I, I thought, you know, we had a, a good response rate uh, from the, uh, from the staff and uh, you know provides a lot of information that I think we can uh, build future uh, uh, ways to address some of the issues that you ra Catherine raised uh, as well so uh, I have one question for Barbara though pardon I do have a question oh. for Barbara on should I ask it now or yes. should I just right. yeah um, I was surprised that and I and I keep looking for it that you have no race data here uh, unless I'm missing it in your in the notes um, through the chair so um, we do have data I just I want to step back and highlight that this briefing note was a response to a request from a committee member at the last GCHRC meeting and um, so it was attempt to provide background in background information on reporting that we've already provided to governance committee last year after we com completed the survey um, we do have some data that we collected on representation, which uh, Director Douglas, we'd be happy to, to provide further details yeah. to you. But Barb, you, here you have, you have gender detail, you have um, nationality, not nationality, but um, birthplace in our Auto Canada. Um, you have sexual orientation, but there's no race data. Did you collect race data? Uh, I'm trying to remember what the report said from last year. We did. We did collect data on people's representation um, in vis as visible minorities and in different equity deserving groups. Um, I don't know if Jamie. Jamie is our senior consultant, equity, diversity, inclusion. She's on the line, and perhaps she can elaborate on the data collected. Yeah, I was surprised because I vaguely remember our conversation last year, but I. Yes, so we do have information on race. When we when I did this presentation, we had sent back to the consulting company to ask them to reconfigure our information for us in a way that more represented some of the information. And that was included in the presentation that I did on the EDI strategy where I talked about this information. But on um, page, sorry, I'm just scrolling to it, page 23 of that full attachment it does go into ethnicity slash racial groups which does a breakdown of the responses that we received and then on the next slide in that slide deck there is a heat map for the uh ethnicity and racial groups there as well what i've been doing in the past uh, few months is actually breaking down this information even further for our staff members on specific racial groups and trying to provide that information and working with our center and the CABER team on making sure that we understand what's happening specifically for black staff, but also other areas. Those first initial questions that say gender, perceptions of inclusion, sexual orientation, et cetera, there were specific questions about that in our survey that we're looking at redoing to see, do we need to include something about race as part of what we're doing to ensure that we're covering all of our bases, but also aligning with the forthcoming race-based data collection strategy that the center is working on. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing any information. I'm looking at your heat map, I'm looking at your your ethnicity and racial group. Here it is. Yes, I found it. Page 34 of the heat 34. map. 34. Yeah. Thank you. And so I know that you're working on a diversity strategy and Barbara, you and I have had these conversations. Um, how are these 
numbers or these trends that you're seeing going to impact your HR strategy? So I will start, and Jamie, if you'd like, you can jump in. Um, the This data provides us baseline, what is current state, and then um, and it is representation that we're looking at, but it is also experience that we're looking at. So in terms of representation, we want to ensure ultimately one important goal is that we have representation across the organization and at all levels in the organization. So that will inform strategies around development, uh, training development, as well as recruitment outreach when we are filling opportunities. But in addition to that, the experience and in, is the part that really contributes to the inclusion, which is what we're striving for. And it is understanding what are the different experiences when we map the identity with the data that we've gathered on the experiences across divisions and across levels. What are the actions that we need to take to ensure that we are seeing favorable outcomes? Where do we need to invest our efforts? education, training, development, there, there are a variety of efforts. So that is, that is how we intend to use this. This is baseline. What will we see when we go to survey the organization next year, which is when our next talk commitment is for surveying? So that was gonna be my next question. So the surveys will happen every two years? Yes, and, and the, per the reasoning behind that, of course, is to take the time to analyze and understand the information we're gathering and then to identify appropriate actions and initiatives to move us along um, and then to give sufficient time so that we can evaluate the outcomes and effectiveness of those actions, survey and see the progress where we're making it, where we need to focus our efforts to continue to move forward. And so in terms of your recruitment strategy, I'm just trying to see how this is going to work on the ground. Um, and I don't have, no, See, Paula, when you say you can't just flip back and forth. Um, if sexual orientation, mm -hmm. um, I think is about two, three percent. I think you, it's, at the, it's at the top of the right. organization of the, of the report. Um, will you then say um, we have two percent of folks who identify as members of the LGBTI community? I'm not sure if that's true um, in, in, in your findings. Um, we, we therefore need to ensure our recruitment strategy for the next year or two is targeted towards um, folks from the LGBTI community. Is that how you see yourself using data in terms of recruitment as one area? I, th I believe that uh, that is one part of it, um, but we would also, uh, so we would be making sure that we do proper outreach. And so, for example, we have uh, our partnerships externally with um, Pride uh, Organization to um, ensure that we are reaching into the market to make diverse areas in the market aware of the opportunities. That is one step. But it also is what are we doing internally? to ensure that our employees who represent from that particular group feel that the workplace is a safe and inclusive organization that makes them comfortable in identifying. Because we may have a certain number indicating they represent that way, but in fact, that number is much yeah, greater. Right? 50% return. Yeah. yeah, so the recruitment is, it's a piece of it, but it is but one piece of it. Mm -hmm. And if we aren't successful in addressing what are the things that are contributing to that particular group not feeling that they are include that we are an inclusive organization? We need to address that because we won't be able to retain the staff that we attract. Thank you. Any, <clears throat> any further questions, Paula? Sorry, uh, eight hundred and eighty-nine comments. Is that? the number of participants? Through the chair, there were uh, just over a thousand participants. We, uh, so. Okay. Doesn't. 
And I believe that the comments, you could have had a participant provide comment in more than one area. So 889 comments doesn't necessarily mean, and JB, correct me, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is comments from 889 different respondents. Is that correct? That's correct. It's comments to specific questions that we had open-ended opportunities for people to provide more context for what they were experiencing, their definition of inclusion. We asked a bunch of open-ended questions that allowed people to provide that information to us. I'm just looking at where that thousand turns up on the results presentation. Yes, but I'm looking at the presentation and asking, and asking where, rather than reading 889, the summary, uh, it must be the quantitative, but the number. Twenty-four hundred. I'm just looking. This was the presentation, but we had a cover report, um, and I'm looking to see. So when we we made this presentation to committee last year, we had a cover report, and I believe the 1100 would have been in the cover report. I'm looking to was find it, the same, it on same slide questions? 35. So in 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 relation to the various questions, each question I think notes. For example, at slide 35 or page 35 of the package, there is a note 1,127 respondents answered this question. At, at uh, page 37, 1,141 respondents answered this question. So it, it, I think there's some variance between various. That's right. Yeah. Question. So we're assuming, I think the report says, sorry, um, Jamie, I think the report says that over 50% participated, so we're assuming it's probably around 1250, 1300 or so. Yes, that's correct. I was just looking and I think one page of the slide is actually missing that has our total respondents and some of those highlights of what we see from the comments and from the information. So I apologize for that. No problem. Any further? Well, I'm just digging in here. Sorry. Go ahead. It's, uh, I, I also echo uh, for doing such a large survey and um, putting any ethnic or racial diversity questions there not being here. There. there is a slide there. On yeah. Well, it's not on your 39. Slide, slide 39. Yeah, ethnicity and racial breakdown. Of the respondents. Yes, so we know their numbers, but we don't have analysis on how different racial or gender or respond to a particular question. I think, Jamie, that's some of the research analysis you're doing now. To correlate the two. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's correct. We do have that information. It's just not in this slide deck. So one of the sections that we had larger questions on was our diversity engagement response questions. And I put some of those examples in this slide deck. Obviously, when I talk about it and do the presentation, there's a little bit more context that I provide that I'm going to share with you now. But within all of those questions, we can actually see a breakdown of those questions from different races, different sexual orientations, from the union or non-union group. Good. And from there, we've really tried to break down what are some of those barriers that were either unintentionally or that are there and how can we start to work towards breaking them down through policy development, training, recruitment initiatives and the like. Thank you. Um, while Paula flips through her chart, um, one of the questions that Uba, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Hi, a couple of years ago, we, I, I remember I asked that um, if we can do similar thing, or I don't know if it's the same thing, we can do the same thing exactly, but if we can figure out who our vendors are, how diverse are they by age, by background, would that be possible? Gender. Gender. I believe, um, thank you through the chair, I believe that our procurement team has been working on this uh, on a policy in relation to that. Um, I don't know 
I don't know if Albert is on the call or Lily would be able to speak to it, but we could certainly follow up because uh, through the procurement team, they have absolutely been addressing this area. It will be good to be able to benchmark and then take a look next year if we made a change and take a look at the City of Toronto's um, vendor policy, social policy as well. <coughs> not, that that they, be, not that they implemented yeah. it. So to be outside of HR, that would be... Yeah, it'd be like, yeah procurement, procurement people. Yeah. Yes, through the Chair, Director Douglas, um, the team are working through the social procurement policy. Uh, we are reviewing some peer competitors as well the City of Toronto's um, um, policy as well to um, to be incorporated into our existing overall procurement and policy framework. In terms of data collection, uh, we're not quite there yet. We have been working with the, the teams, especially on the operation side, um, to um, review the framework and also the vendor group groups to be included in that uh, discussion. Um, for example, the tenants or tenant allowed um, vendors as well. But for the next report back, we will be uh, collecting the data and present the information. Thank you, Lily. Um, do you keep a preferred vendor list like the city does? We do. Thank you. Um, we're hoping any exercise will take a look at that list as well. Absolutely. Paula, did you have another question? Yeah, so what I'm hearing is that there'll be further work based on who answered, um, correlate their satisfaction levels based on groupings, right? So that work has been done and that work is informing the strategy that we brought forward and the actions that we are undertaking in terms of training, policy development, recruitment. And yes. So, uh, uh, no, there are, there's just issues here where, because it's broken down into various areas, where I think the board has to have a look because there says dissatisfaction with management in certain areas, and I don't think that's for management to review their, their own dissatisfaction. So I think we need to parse that part out and be sure that we're understanding what that is, where that's coming from, and if any, there's any remediative steps, right? Pardon me? Yeah, so this isn't... We're asking a, then for, have a correlation between the demographic information and the issues that were identified so we know what issues are important to which group. How difficult is that to... Generate. So that is information that we have, that is an analysis that we undertook, that would be uh, a natural outcome of carrying out a survey like this where you are looking to see where are the issues. Are the issues at certain, at a division level, are the issues at levels within a particular, within the hierarchy of the organization, and are the, are the issues specific to specific equity deserving groups? All of that information, to the best of our ability based on the responses that we have, is information that has been taken, analyzed, and used to inform the action plan that has previously been presented to the committee and to the board, and that continues to inform the work that we're doing. And we will continue to bring that back for regular updates to reflect progress. I, I think that would be helpful because I don't re recall us having that conversation. And I think as a board, it's good. I'm glad that you, you're using it to determine um, best way forward, but I think as a board, it's good for us to understand what the problem is as well as what the, your solutions are. Well, maybe in the, in the meantime, uh, Barbara, we could discuss that so that for a future board meeting, we can get it in a form that uh, is concise, but, but points to areas we need to focus on. Yeah, or, or, or areas that you've identified based on the data, right? But it'll be, it'll be good for yeah, us to know because we, we, these things are all interconnected. 
Um, so it would be good for us to know if people with disabilities are finding it difficult to work with a division, as an example. So we can spend Absolutely. some talking on that and look at bringing back a, a brief yes. summary of that. Oh, Marcel, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, when it comes to recruitment, um, do you use, have Pardon? you provided a recruitment? Oh, wait. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, when it comes to uh, recruitment, um, you say that you're reaching out to diverse groups and everything. Do you have a listing of different, like, agencies and, um, like, employment agencies that you outreach to when it comes to uh, employment opportunities at TCHC? And if you do, did we get a list of it? And if we didn't, could we get a list of them? Uh, through the chair, um, the answer is yes. When we do our recruitment, we do undertake broad outreach, uh, depending for the different roles that we're recruiting for. And I think maybe it would be helpful um, I know that I have Kelly Schultes, who is our Director of Talent Management. Um, she may want to add to this, but we'd be happy to bring back a briefing note that outlines what our strategy is to undertake broad outreach to source diverse candidates in general to give you a sense um, of that. But Kelly, if you wanted to add to that. No, Barbara, we can definitely uh, provide that briefing note. and we do you have a, a current list that we continually update to make sure that we have the right uh, sources that we can post on or become partners with certain organizations? I'm not sure, Mar Marcel, whether you're asking, so say for frontline positions, there's a, a certain way to reach out to hire people from that group. There are sort of middle management there'd be another different process. For senior management, there'd be a third process, and maybe there's even more distinctions than that. But, uh, but each, depending on the position, would have its own. So um, there probably could be a briefing note or a summary of, of the process used with, with the different groups and how, how, the, uh, how the positions are either advertised or, or recruited through agencies. Certainly we can do that. Thank you. Any further questions on this item? No? Then I'll look for a motion uh, to uh, receive uh, this uh, item on the agenda uh, for, a pro for just, just have to receive it, I guess. Yeah, uh, moved by Uba, seconded by Paula. All those in favor, motions carried. We have another item that has been held. Uh, that's item number seven, and uh, our, our deputant is uh, Catherine. Uh, I believe you're still able to connect, and that's with regard to the strategic communication plan. Catherine. Uh, yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Alrighty. So um, the communications in this organization, and I can actually comment on that because I've been around for a while, they've really greatly improved over the past couple of years. And I'm confident that we have raised the bar uh, in the best practices and standards, and I look forward to seeing what comes next. I do have a couple of areas in the presentation that I would like to comment on. One of them is on page 27, uh, the KBAR Confronting Anti-Black Racism Strategy, and the bullet that says staff messages in response to world events, putting them into context with the KBAR strategy. Now, the, this, the KBAR's mandate is to drive tenant satisfaction and staff engagement by embedding anti-Black racism analysis into Toronto housing culture and operations. So that being the mandate, I was not aware that KBAR would be publicly responding to world events. Um, and in January of this year, 
uh, the CEO in KBAR posted a, a statement regarding police brutality involving five Ohio police officers. It was a really well-written, compassionate statement. But around that time, there was also a Toronto policing incident involving three police officers, and the family is currently suing the officers and the Toronto Police Services Board. Uh, to my knowledge, KBAR did not make a public statement about the Toronto police incident. We know that racism and police brutality in the United States happens almost daily and is regularly reported in the media. Toronto Housing would need to hire additional communication staff in order for the CEO and KBAR to publicly address this injustice on a regular basis. And I support the work of KBAR, and I know they've made great strides, and I have every confidence they will bring about necessary change to make Toronto housing not just a better place to live, but a better place to work. My concern is that Toronto Housing as a social housing landlord, publicly commenting on uh, police matters in the United States or here in Toronto that may be before the courts, and whether there could be unforeseen consequences to the corporation or the shareholder. So that's my feedback on that. Now, I had the opportunity to visit our new website. And when I first landed on that homepage, the text and photos were so huge, I actually had to back up from my computer and figure out how I could make things smaller. So perhaps we need to consider a standard default size that would work for all visitors. And to, so, and also to make it more user friendly, we might consider adding a universal magnifying glass with a plus or minus sign so that one can easily adjust whatever they're looking at on the website, wherever they are on the website. Now, I, I heard uh, Councillor Fletcher's comments regarding the meetings uh, being, uh, materials being posted on the website. It's unfortunate. Um, I, I don't believe Councillor Fletcher was at that meeting. Uh, because I did make a deputation there, and I'm going to speak to this issue again. So currently, past board meetings are posted on the new website for 2021, 22, and 23 only. It's like Toronto County Housing didn't exist before that. There is no indication that 2004 to 2020 meetings ever took place or will be added at a later date. With these agendas and minutes, we've been constantly talking about. So perhaps we need to add a sentence or something to the website to let people know more information is coming. And when we had this conversation at, at the board, it was quite uh, in depth actually. Uh, and the conversation included uh, Jag as the CEO uh, and apparently, and maybe Derek could speak to this or Paula, there that the city and Toronto County Housing are having meetings and they're currently having a conversation because the city faces some similar challenges and they're looking at ways that we could actually restore uh, these materials back to uh, the public domain. So I think that's important for the councillor to know and understand what that is, when it's gonna happen, if it's gonna happen. Um, and like the city, it's a public, uh, you know, we as Toronto County Housing are a public corporation and transparency is not optional. You know, putting materials on the public domain, um, it's not based on the number of hits. It's actually a requirement. So I want to flag that. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the tenant advisory committee. And we've heard a lot about this. I don't know what's happening with your timer, but I know I haven't been speaking for five minutes. On May 3rd, I identified a technical glitch on the website application form to staff and asked them to provide me with an application. I got no response. On May 12th, the application deadline, I tried to apply on the new website in hopes that it had been resolved. It has not. In frustration, you know, I just printed out the forum, cut and paste my responses and sent photos and sent it that way. On May 9th, I received the tenant loop newsletter, which included a one page insert promoting the Tenant Advisory Committee, which identified two WebEx information sessions of April 27 and May 4th. Both of these dates had already passed. You know, although multiple outreach tools were used in the promotion of the Tenant Advisory Committee, 
the glitches on the website application form and late notice regarding the information sessions, we will never know if some tenants actually missed the opportunity to participate. At yeah. this point, yeah. I'm almost Ms. Wilkinson, embarrassed. Catherine, I'm yeah. sorry, uh, as much as I want uh, to hear your, your deputation, we need to follow our rules of five minutes and and uh, we'll we'll have some questions and maybe you can amplify on your issues that you haven't been able to at that point uh, hopefully that's satisfactory now, can i just say brian that i timed my deputations and this was under five minutes so i don't know how i ran out of time anyway you did it's uh, our right. clock All right i have a question the clock but we have a question for you and hopefully that, okay, that, my well, question, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? <laughs> Did, oh, just that I'm embarrassed this happens and Toronto Community Housing, look, I'm begging you, please test your materials where you want the public to apply or respond online. You gotta test drive those materials before you post them. And you really have to check materials that you include in the tenant newsletter, particularly where there's community meeting dates you're inviting them to. That's it, thank you. Uh, Thanks you put, very much, I'm Catherine. sorry, is that a written deputation that you've made today or oral? No, no, it's an oral. I didn't I, submit it. I'd be happy to share it. I'm so, pardon? I'm asking the deputant, Mr. Chair. Could you could you provide it to us in yes, writing? Yes, yes Councillor Fletcher, I'd be happy to provide the, it in writing. The, um, the tenant advisory part, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, yes ma'am. Other uh, questions uh, for the deputant? Uba? I'm just curious, what's happening now if, as uh, Catherine said, if she misses both uh, webinars, could that, could that be repeated? Like, what, what's going to happen? So if there's staff that could respond to that question? So through the chair, we have completed the initial outreach for the Tenant Advisory Committee. I believe we have 49 applicants to date. Um, I had not heard of the issue that Ms. Wilkinson flagged in terms of having issues logging into the website and applying online. I'm going to have to investigate with Paula's team in terms of whether any tenants were left out of that process and if anybody was interested in applying post getting the tenant uh, loop. So I need to follow up on that. This is all news to me. My apologies. So I guess if we could have someone from IT uh, connect with Catherine to see if this was a unique issue uh, just happening to Catherine or whether it was uh, broader to many individuals who might have tried and gave up uh, uh, in, in, in trying to list for that. Uh, that would be helpful to try and understand why, why it happened. That would be great. Can I respond, Brian? I just want to say this was not unique to me. There were other tenants who told me they had the same experience with glitches on the application form. So I'm not here speaking on behalf of myself. I'm really drawing the point that citywide, tenants may have missed an opportunity because it was frustrating if you couldn't type into the application form on the website. Yeah. So this isn't about me. This is about the opportunity for all tenants. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. Sometimes, uh, as myself, you know, it's my clarified it. my technical issues, and sometimes they're broader than my own. So, thanks for clarifying that. Thank uh, you. We we can. Uh, uh, Marcel, do you have a? Yeah, um, I'm I'm a little confused here. I thought. Um, like tenant directors were going to be part of the tenant advisory committee and so i i'm not really sure like what what happened here did i totally miss something i don't i don't get it you don't have to apply so through the chair yes that my is. apologies through the chair um we are working on the invitations that will be going out to all tenant directors we haven't finalized the first meeting date we're looking for i believe end of june and working on schedule so that information will be coming to you shortly nothing was sent out to date so 
So the three tenant directors will be included. Yeah. Absolutely. They're included by but yeah, by their position. Yeah. Um, any further uh, questions? Yeah. Paula? Yes. Um, I consider this pretty serious. So is it the case that tenants got a flyer with the information about the uh, sessions after they were finished? Is that So through the chair, um, I will have to follow up with Paula Knight and the communications team. I wasn't aware that the information flyer on the info sessions were put in the loop after the fact. So, or, or the dates weren't aligned. So I need to follow up on that. It, it's quite possible. I just, I, I didn't have that information to, available to me. And, and through the chair, we're actually just confirming that right now. So Nadia, I'll be able to connect with you on that just to confirm what was actually in the tenant loop based on uh, Ms. Wilkinson's comments, so thank you. Maybe Ms. Uh, Wilkinson can send me the flyer as well when she sends the letter. And this was to be done in consultation with the city. So how was this undertaken in consultation with the city? So through the chair, all of the outreach mechanisms and um, approaches were actually worked through with the city and the city was also in attendance at the info session so it was all done as a joint effort with the city i think we just need to clarify both the online element so if there's tenants that were unable to sign in online or apply online and individuals that might have gotten information late but absolutely the city was involved throughout the process so they won't have been aware that the uh, portal wasn't operational or improperly operating, they couldn't get through. So through the chair, I'm not sure that they would be aware of that. I certainly wasn't. It was the first time I'm hearing about it today. So, so yeah, I will need to follow up. So uh, just, just to just yeah. to be clear, so, sorry through the chair, I don't believe it was an issue with the portal. I believe it was an issue with the form. Um, that's a PDF form. That's what we I understood through um, Miss Wilkinson. I don't believe people had an issue actually joining the webex meeting itself oh, no, it's more the, the actual, meeting. actual sorry it's the application yeah the application form that's correct and it's a pdf form so uh, that's what we're just trying to figure out whether or not that had any glitches in it um that weren't weren't remediated so yeah so we're, i just want to make sure we were we were on the right thing thank you so yeah marcel yeah considering um the glitches and everything, would there be um, like almost like another uh, re-invite for tenants who are interested? And then as far as the WebEx, um, uh, oh, I forgot what you called it. Um, would that also be part of it? Like just like a, almost like a restart kind of it of the uh, tenant advisory outreach? Through the chair, I'm absolutely happy to revisit that, I think. Certainly, um, if this issue was widespread, it's a significant issue and we need to address that. So I need to follow up with the team and the city to look at whether we extend the outreach and the timelines. So I'll be able to have an update at the next TSC, but absolutely that's something we'll need to look into. Thank you. And if I may, just through the chair, I have the team actually going through the form itself right now and it is actually working currently. So I'm not sure which period um, this was an issue, but the form in its current uh, current iteration is is functioning um, in the right way. Well, I think we're Question. asking the deadline's passed. I, I under Correct. I understand that. No, the form's functioning, but the form there's no use for the form because the deadline for the form is passed. Is that correct? The the process has ended at, at current process, but there's. I guess the question I was going to ask was, can it be extended? That's if, not my question. If, am I you asking or am I asking? Well, you can ask your question, Paula. I was want to ask my question. I can't remember who started. That's all. You go right ahead. Go I'm ahead, just Brian. wanting to then know if back. there were significant groups that were unfortunately excluded, for whether it's technical or other issues. Uh, is there a way to? reach out to those groups to see if there are interest in individuals who want, would like to participate. 
So through the chair, I will take it back to the team and the city. I don't see that being an issue, and I'm happy to extend the deadline if it doesn't have a significant impact on when the, the TAC will meet. But I will need to take that back with the staff. My commitment after today is to revisit that to see if we can extend the deadline and have another info session that will allow people to participate. Paula? Well, I'd actually like to move that. So I'm not, I'm not satisfied with hearing that you can get in the portal when the deadline was May 12th. It obviously wasn't working for someone and apparently for others. So I am quite concerned about this because it's a, we added tenants. We added tenants from the self-selected tenants from the tenant engagement. We added three tenant directors. This has to be absolutely the best process ever. So I want to move that we reopen that and the date of June is your date. This has to be right. I think when the city hears that that was not operable, they're going to be very upset about that. And um, I'm just going to assume it was not operable. Ms. Wilkinson has been a tenant representative on this board for six years, so she's not somebody who doesn't know how to run a website or make an application. And uh, so I'm, I, you can obviously hear that I am more than frustrated by this glitch and would like it rectified so that everybody has a chance to put their name in for this organization. And you'll remember that we did this because it was a self-selected group and other tenants wanted to be part of it, and that's why we did it. So if not every tenant who wished to be part of it had the opportunity because of a technical glitch or an IT glitch, it's actually up to TCHC to make that right and the city. So perhaps discuss that with tenants first and see how you'd like to proceed. And I'm sure our tenant reps who are going to be on there, our board members, want to have a very clean process when they get there. We don't want deputations from people saying, well, I couldn't get in. Because that'll be the first deputation, and I'm not having it. Your motion, Paula, is to extend the deadline and to have a report back on, on whether there were exclusions. Uh, and, and how uh, we can add additional um, uh, members uh, to, the, to the group. So well, the next meeting we can make have sure that that's report. working, the yeah, link, and that meeting. everything can work. And I'm sorry, you can hear I'm frustrated. I had to go to council to have this expanded. So is, is, is that the motion, I guess, as I'm asking you? the motion to extend the deadline and to have a report back on, on at, at our next meeting. Yes, or to the board. The board, no. If, uh, I guess the question is, is timing because the next, well, when the next regular board meeting is uh, in June? Next meeting. Which? Our next uh, board meeting in June is, is you know, Dara, sorry. Sorry, next board meeting is June 27th. Um, next prior GRC to that, uh, next GCRC, GCHRC meeting is July 4th. So the June meeting would be the first one. Correct. And is that reasonable, uh, Nadia and Paula, to be able to come back uh, and uh, provide that information at that meeting in, in, at the June board meeting? So through the chair, we actually have a tenant services committee where we were coming with an update on the tenant advisory committee. So we should have information by then, but we can definitely bring it back to the June board meeting. Which, which I'm sorry, I missed what meeting you referred to. <coughs> There's a tenant services oh, committee tenant meeting services on meeting. June 12th. So we have an update on oh, the tenant so advisory committee that, and other elements. So that we can add it to that a, if necessary. If you can meet that deadline, that would probably be the right place to have it. Paula, you're on tenant services, aren't you? Yeah. yeah so. so great. That would be good. Uh, so we have a, a motion by Paula, the seconder by Marcel. I'll second it. 
Yes. Thank you. All those in favor? Motions carried. Um, any uh, further uh, questions from board members with regard to the uh, strategic communication plan? None. Uh, then I would uh, like a motion to receive the report uh, being presented, the strategic communications plan report. So, uh, motion by uh, Marcel, you're willing to move that? Uh, yes. Seconded by Uba. Are you all those in favor? Uh, motion's carried.